Growing up, I never really thought much about what it takes to get mental health care. I never really thought about what you should do if you weren't feeling mentally well. I didn't know anybody in therapy, and I didn't know what steps one would actually take if they were not feeling well. That all changed April 16, 2007. I was finishing up my doctoral degree in engineering, and I was teaching a class on my own for the first time. I was really excited about graduation and what I was going to do with the rest of my life. That morning was a bright, sunny April day, but it felt peculiar because even though the sun was shining, I could see a few snowflakes falling in the window from my office. And I looked down to my computer, and I had received an email from the university. And it said that there had been a student on campus with a gun. But for some reason, the way the email was worded, it didn't really affect me enough to change my plans for the day, and so I, I went on with work. By the end of the day, we learned that 32 students, faculty and staff, had been shot and killed by that student. And he also shot and killed himself. It was one of the scariest, darkest, and saddest days in my life. But not only for me, but for everyone around me. The day itself is somewhat foggy. I remember the snowflakes. I remember that taxes were due. I remember my mom calling me and, and crying hysterically because she hadn't been able to reach me because none of the cell phones worked because they had been overloaded with all the phone calls. In the days that followed, my friends and I didn't really know how to function or think. We used to talk about big ideas, how to get published, what we were going to do after graduation, and managing complex schedules, but our conversations regressed to whether or not we had remembered to eat. It was like the days between Christmas and New Year's, where you don't really know what day it is or what to do, and you can't be bothered to leave the house or take off your comfiest pajamas. And then suddenly, classes resumed, and I was back teaching my class again. However, there were conspicuously empty seats from students that we knew from the news had suffered unspeakable tragedies even though they had survived. And I didn't know what to say. I did remember feeling that we were on our own to figure out what to do next. I now know that depression is a common mental disorder and chronic condition. Around the world, 300 million people are diagnosed with depression, making it the most prevalent chronic condition. However, this number is likely a lot larger, as most people won't receive a diagnosis because they can't find a provider that they trust. They worry about the stigma of getting mental health care treatment, or they don't believe they have a treatable problem. The Journal of General Internal Medicine ran a study that said that only about one-third of people who are diagnosed with depression seek treatment. An even smaller number of those people complete treatment to the point where their symptoms are alleviated. This means that there are a lot of people in the world that would benefit from treatment for their mental well-being that aren't getting treatment. This is a glib picture of our community mental health. And it doesn't have to be that way. Every person that needs help for their mental well-being should be able to access it without fear or stigma. What if we attacked the problem of access to mental health care with an engineering approach. I'm an engineer by training, and I've dedicated most of my career to studying doctors and patients to understand that the work that they do to use technology to provide more effective, efficient, safer care that can be accessed by more people. And I think that a lot of the approaches that I use in my work could be used to provide more care for mental health to more people. 
What if we optimize diagnosis? What if we automated treatment? What if we integrated mental well-being into everyday life? One of the first problems after the Virginia Tech tragedy is that people didn't know if they should seek treatment or not. And I remember feeling like I didn't know if I was okay. You know, I felt like I wasn't directly affected. Some of my friends were killed, but I wasn't. And perhaps I shouldn't be taking resources from other people that are more affected. Perhaps I should figure out a way to forget and move on. And in some ways, that's exactly what I did. I never sought treatment. I found a way to move forward. I tried to avoid talking about it for many years. And even if I found a way to cope, maybe I was just getting by and not maximizing my well-being. After the Virginia Tech tragedy, we received an email. Um, and it said, get help if you need it. Get help if you need it. And I understood the words, but I didn't understand exactly what that meant for me. How would I know if I needed help? And also at this point, how could realistically all 30,000 students had experienced a tragedy? This is a small town on top of a mountain with a small hospital. There could not realistically be enough health professionals to diagnose, treat, and monitor all of those people. And that doesn't include the number of faculty, staff, and people that live in the community. The number of the affected could even extend to alums, parents of children. How would all of these people be able to receive treatment? What if instead of receiving that email that says, get help if you need it, every person received a link to a survey, a validated clinical instrument to diagnose depression and other mental health disorders. We call this patient-reported outcomes. So this is where patients will take the same surveys that a clinician would give you in a clinical setting. And patients use this to help monitor your symptoms and your diagnoses over time. What if we gave that to the students themselves? One of the benefits of taking a survey like this is that the university, with permission from the students, of course, is that they could then understand a collective mental picture of how well the students were doing. So imagine if you had a map of how every person was doing, every major, every demographic, every dorm. And then you could see who was doing well and who wasn't doing well. And then with this information, the university could then mathematically allocate the right resources to the right groups. So the people that needed the most urgent care could get the best care first. The people who didn't need the, the, the most urgent care could then get more cost-effective treatment. What if we had a map of every student's mental well-being? There are a lot of barriers to seeking mental health care treatment. So for most people, first you have to have some kind of health insurance. Uh, if, you don't have, if you do have health insurance, even then you have to find a provider that is covered by your insurance. Then you have to call them and make an appointment. Usually after this, sometimes it takes months before you actually get to talk to someone. Then you have to negotiate time off of work, childcare, transportation, and then you finally get to go and meet this person and you learn about the treatment approach. You learn about them. And then if it's not a good match, if it's not the right treatment approach, if it's not somebody that you can trust, that you feel like you can talk to, then you have to start the process all over again. This can be six months easy. What if we use technology to reduce a lot of these barriers to treatment? There's this growing movement of digital health technology interventions that allow people to receive treatment um, using their computers and mobile devices in wherever location is, they're comfortable, their homes, their offices, their workplaces. Some of these tools take self-guided approaches where you would go through the same exercises and education systems that you would receive from a clinician to receive education about mental health, but also treatment. 
Studies have shown that internet-based cognitive behavioral therapy can be equally as effective as face-to-face -face cognitive behavioral therapy. These tools are often free. They can be immediately used and accessible if you have access to them. And they reduce a lot of the barriers to treatment. For people that aren't comfortable with a self-guided approach, there are digital tools that are augmented with a, a, a therapist or a coach. And this, this is an approach where you're still using your computer or your mobile device, but there's a therapist or coach that's coaching you along the way, digitally via text or phone. What this does is it augments the number of people that a therapist can care for by allowing them to care for multiple people at the same time. There are also digital mental health intervention tools that more similarly mimic face-to-face -face consultations, like video chat or chat-based or phone-based system. And sure, you could, you could find a therapist by going through your insurance provider, and they may be able to provide video counseling services. But what's different about these systems is that they take a pool of providers from around the world with all different expertise, diversity, treatment approaches, and it allows you as an individual to find someone that best matches what you need. So for example, if you're looking for someone that can speak to you right away, there may be someone that's available. If you're looking for someone that is going to use a treatment approach that you think is going to be best fit for you, you may be able to find someone without the confines within your local community. What's also really helpful with these approaches is that if, if you need to make changes, it's a lot quicker. You can easily say, you know what, this isn't working for me, and then move on to the next person. So it does cost money to, to work with a licensed clinical therapist. Um, and so a lot of these tools are not free, even though um, they can be quite low cost. But there are similar tools that use similar approaches of computer-assisted mental well-being help with uh, mobile devices and phones that rely on trained volunteers that can provide text, phone, and video chat consultations. And this can be great for people who just want someone to talk to. Now, imagine that after the Virginia Tech tragedy, instead of getting that email that said, get help if you need it, every student received a link to this validated clinical assessment. And they take this survey, and all of the students that, that are not doing well, that have high mental health needs, are then immediately linked with a virtual counselor from somewhere in the country that they can launch into a video chat session right away. All of the students that have moderate well-being are then given a link to a self-guided therapeutic system where they can go through a therapeutic approach themselves and learn about mental illness and different triggers for six to 10 weeks. All of the students that aren't comfortable with digital tools but need immediate care are then given a timely phone call from a human therapist in their local community. Anybody else that may not meet clinical diagnosis criteria but still would benefit from talking to someone is then given a link to link up with someone around the country who has volunteered that has training in trauma and college students so that they can have someone to talk to for six to 10 weeks. With this approach, every person would get access to mental care. Nobody would be left alone to deal with this. The final point in this plan is the notion of integrating mental well-being into everyday life. Like most people, a lot of my life takes place in the digital space. I communicate with my friends and my family using my phone and my computer. I communicate with people that I work with using my phone and my computer. I receive the news from websites and social media. If I need to find out information for something, I'm likely to search on the internet before I go to the library these days. The devices and the services that I use likely know a lot about me, and they probably know a lot about my mental well-being. Studies have shown that services like Facebook can tell when you're depressed based on the amount of time that you spend on the site, and also the types of information that you interact with. They also can control the type of information that they show you. 
For example, whenever there is a mass shooting, I am burdened and overwhelmed with images and stories of tragedy at a time when it's probably not healthy for my mental well-being. I can't search on Google for my college transcripts without seeing stories of the Virginia Tech shooting. And to give you some perspective, in 2017, there was a mass shooting almost every day. And so this means that most days when I'm just trying to get through the day and go about my work, I am reminded of one of the worst days of my life. Technology has shown that they have the capabilities to grasp our attention. And they've used a variety of techniques and tactics to capture our attention. And they've also shown that sometimes they can take that attention and direct it in the wrong direction in a way that is harmful for our mental well-being. What if they flip that? Technology should be used to improve our mental well-being. What if they use that power to improve our well-being? It could be as simple as seeing that someone is consuming this information of trauma and asking them if they would like that information blocked for 24 hours so that they can process it in a healthy way. It could be as simple as noticing that someone has been binge-watching videos of traumatic events and asking them if they are okay, and even better, intervening with support. It could be as transformative as helping us understand our own mental well-being with all the information they have and giving us tools and techniques to improve ourselves. Sure, there are filters and configurations that you could use to do a lot of this stuff, but we shouldn't have to opt in to mental well-being to use technology. These, this idea of optimizing diagnosis and automating treatment and integrating well-being into everyday life don't necessarily have to be limited to situations like school shootings. They can be used in any kind of community trauma. trauma. Imagine what the world would be like if all 30,000 students had received support for their mental well-being after the Virginia Tech shooting. Imagine what the world would be like if all of the affected people from the hundreds of mass shootings in the United States had received support for their mental well-being. Imagine what the world would be like if we as a society decided to prioritize mental well-being and provide free and timely access to the tools for mental health for every person.